three, six, numbers three, and we're just doing verses one to 20. Page one, three, six, verses one to 20. This is the account of the family of Aaron and Moses at the time the Lord talked with Moses on Mount Sinai. The names of the sons of Aaron were Nadab, the firstborn, and Abidu, Eleazar, and Ithimar. Those were the names of Aaron's sons, the anointed priests who were ordained to serve as priests. Nadab and Abihu, however, fell dead before the Lord when they made an offering with unauthorized fire before him in the desert of Sinai. They had no sons, so only Eleazar and Ithamar served as priests during the lifetime of their father, Aaron. The Lord said to Moses, bring the tribe of Levi, and present them to Aaron the priest to assist him. They are to perform duties for him and for the whole community at the tent of meeting by doing the work of the tabernacle. They are to take care of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work of the tabernacle. Give the Levites to Aaron and his sons, They are the Israelites who are to be given wholly to him. Appoint Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. Anyone else who approaches the sanctuary must be put to death. The Lord also said to Moses, I have taken the Levites from among the Israelites in place of the first male offspring of every Israelite woman. The Levites are mine for all the firstborn are mine. When I struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, I set apart for myself every firstborn in Israel, whether man or animal. They are to be mine. I am the Lord. The Lord said to Moses in the desert of Sinai, count the Levites by their families and clans. Count every male a month old or more. So Moses counted them as he was commanded by the word of the Lord. These were the names of the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. These are the names of the Gershonite clans, Libni and Shimei. The Gothonite clans, Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. The Merarite clans, Mali and Mushi. These were the Levite clans, according to their families. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, sorry, it's me again. But blame Joe. After this, he'll know his lesson. He'll never take a sabbatical again. But uh, let's, let's just pray, okay? Oh, Father in heaven, we, our vision of Jesus is just so small that we don't instinctively fall down before him, bow before him in reverence and awe. And uh, Father, we pray that if you only just open our eyes, we would see Jesus and his glory, not just in every page of the Bible, but in the whole earth. And Father, we pray that you would help us this evening to taste and see that Jesus is good, because if you don't do that for us, we wouldn't want more of him. Teach us, we pray, we beg you, to worship in spirit and in truth, to worship you acceptably with reverence and awe, for you are a consuming fire. Amen. Great. Um, I've got some illustrations here. Um, I don't think many of you would know what it is unless you are very, very posh, all right? Um, it's, uh, some of you might know the film Kingsman. Anyone watched it before? Kingsman? Good. No one under 18 has watched it because that's the rating. I was just trying to trick you. But anyway, the film Kingsman, <laughs> sorry. The film Kingsman is actually inspired by um, uh, a shop on Savile Row called The Huntsman. All right? 
uh, and it's a really posh traditional tailor shop, uh, and there are loads of all these things hanging up on, on, uh, on the ceiling. You can see Tati will show you. Uh, okay, and what these are, they are very, they're called paper patterns, okay, and they are a very important part of the process of making clothes that fit you really, really well, uh, that you're comfortable with, that you like, and you really enjoy wearing, okay, and so your shape and your measurements are taken, and it's a bit like a template, so um, I, I actually emailed them, and they sent me the, these ones, all right, and these are actually shapes of someone's uh, backside and legs, all right? These are trouser patterns, okay? So from this template, uh, from this template, the cloth is cut to size, uh, cut to shape, and then you get to try it on. And if it's not right, you just go to the shop, you try it. If it's not right, they'll cut off more bits. They'll shape it properly until you're really happy, at least three times, all right? And then finally, you get exactly what you want and exactly what you like. And you know what? 3,000 pounds poorer. But anyway, that's just what I... Uh, um, so, um, many people, but I think many people, would like church to be a bit more like a tailor shop, right? We want church to fit in more with what we like and what we prefer, uh, and that's how many people decide uh, whether they've enjoyed church or a service. You know, is it, is it more my style? You know, are, are there people there like me, people I like, people my age? You know, does it fit, me, fit in with my ideals? You know, do they say the things that I want to hear in the way that I want to hear it? And if not, I'll make suggestions or more, co no, maybe not commonly here, but I'll grumble and I'll complain. Because what I want to do is to reshape church to fit me. And if church isn't going to change to fit me, well, like a tailor shop, I'll just go find another one. And church leaders are not immune at all to the pressures uh, uh, and the grumbling and the fear of people leaving. You know, so um, in some churches, like, they know some people don't like to hear certain things, they don't like certain bits of the Bible, they never preach on that. Be quiet about those things. Or, or, or people complain sermons are too long. You know, so a decision is made to cut it short. Church is boring. So people get their heads together to try and see, oh, what can we do to make church a bit more exciting? My children unengaged. Uh, uh, you know, they distract me from really listening, really worshipping the Lord. Okay, let's send them out to Sunday school. You know, people only want to engage with people who are like them at the same stage of life as them. Fine, we'll set up groups. Tell you what, better still, we we'll just go and set up churches and plant churches where everyone is just the same. Or a minister that I know from a different church he was told to stop preaching from the pulpit and that he had to preach from a, a, a transparent, fancy, perspex sort of lectern and he can't stand behind it and do what I'm doing, reading from notes and stuff like that because, you know, he's got to really walk around and preach because people can't engage. People can't become Christians if they just preach by standing behind the pulpit, that kind of stuff. Do you see that? People will fall asleep. People won't engage. But you get the point. Like bespoke clothes, we want to change church and to make it all fit in with what we want and what we prefer. And like bespoke tailors, churches chop and change to give people what they want. But you know what? Church is not meant to be a place that fits in with what we want or shaped by what we prefer. It's the total opposite. You know, in Numbers, Jesus is giving us His vision, His template for church. All right, uh, we saw it last week, didn't we? It's with him at the center, with the tabernacle at the center. It's cross-shaped, and we are meant to fit in with it. And if it doesn't feel like, uh, if it doesn't feel right in the beginning, instead of reshaping church, we are meant to be reshaped. We are the ones who are meant to change if we're ever really going to enjoy being at church and to feel at home in the kind of church that Jesus wants us to be, all right? And that's what, happen, that what, that's what happens whenever we come together as a church that is genuinely Jesus-centered and cross-shaped. You know, fallen, marred, uh, horribly distorted by sin sort of people like us. We are being reshaped by Jesus to be more like Him, all right? So maybe in your discussions later, uh, you know, some of you meet after this, uh, 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 why not discuss this? What are you looking for in church or when you come to church? What do you really want from church? Do you want church to change, to fit in with you or, and what you want? Or do you come looking and expecting to be reshaped so that you can become more like Jesus? That's your desire. I come to church because I want to be more like Jesus, more cross-shaped in my life and my thinking and so on. 
So do you need to change what you're looking for in church so that it fits in more with what Jesus actually wants you to be looking for in church? And as a church, uh, you know, there's a PCC meeting and so on, leadership, whatever, are we too worried about what people want and prefer that we end up changing Jesus' template for church to fit in more comfortably with what we want and pref- what people want and prefer, all right? So we've looked at the tribes uh, camping around uh, uh, the tabernacle in Numbers 1 and 2. In Numbers 3 to 4, the focus is more on what goes on in the middle, right, around the tabernacle. A couple of slides forward, you'll see that, okay? Now, uh, all this, right, is a po- chapter 3 and 4 is a powerful reminder of how we are meant to relate to the living God and to worship Him. We tend to assume that we know exactly what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth, don't we? A lot of Christians talk about, I talk about it as well, like I'm an expert on worship. You know, how I like to worship, the style I prefer, the songs I enjoy. I even talk about what visitors might like, what engages young people these days and so on. But we very rarely hear people talking about and asking how does the Lord God himself actually want to be worshipped? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 to 29. We are called to worship God acceptably, with reverence and with awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I.e., there is worship that is not acceptable, that is not pleasing to the living God, even if it might feel really nice to us. And we need to be taught how to worship acceptably with reverence and awe because it's not natural to us as fallen sinners. So here in Numbers, the Lord doesn't leave it to the church to decide how to worship the Lord or to do whatever their heart tells them to do. He's giving very specific instructions on how the living God is to be approached and worshipped. And isn't it quite interesting that he's been really structured and organised? You almost read it and like, oh my goodness, right? But sometimes in our reaction or overreaction against dead formalism and ritual, sometimes people go right to the other end of the spectrum, right? And assume that the height of truly spiritual worship is when it's a free from all, when everyone does whatever they felt, feel led, yeah? That kind of language. But while the Lord does warn us about empty rituals or, or, or forms of services that are done mindlessly without heart and, and stuff like that, it doesn't mean that for real spiritual worship to take place, we need to get rid of all forms and structures. It doesn't mean that, all right? Remember the Lord right at the beginning of creation. You know, the first thing He did was to bring order out of what is otherwise chaotic. And so by His commands here in Numbers, Jesus is bringing what would otherwise be a chaotic church into order. And and I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. It's not like the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is really frustrated, right? Ah, Jesus, you know, all these rules and commands that you're giving about how uh, to to people how to do church, you're just hindering me from doing a real work, from moving powerfully in the church. You've got to get rid of some of those structures you put in place if revival, you know, if a new movement of me, the Holy Spirit, is ever going to happen. The Spirit Himself puts His seal on this, Remember? It's the Spirit who is writing down every single one of these instructions for the church, for us in this age as well. So I don't know where this idea about the Spirit not being able to move freely because of formal structures in the church comes from. Formal structures are useless if they become idols, but really the thing that stops the Spirit moving powerfully in the life of the church is our own hardness of heart. When we grieve Him, through the chaos of our sin, when we come to church looking to do whatever we want, looking for selfish things, as opposed to, you know what I mean, thinking that we're free to worship God in whatever way we want. Now, I don't know where I've heard this before, but people sometimes talk about, I don't know, relaxing into a service, right? Um, I'm not so sure about that because again and again, throughout the Bible, we see how dangerous it is when people try to approach and connect with or worship the living God in a relaxed way, based simply on what felt right to them and what felt sincere from them. In verses 2 to 4 in Numbers, right, do you see? The names of the sons of Aaron were Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. doesn't matter how you pronounce them, just got to pretend that you know how it's pronounced. Um, like me. Those were the names of Aaron's sons, the anointed priests, 
who were ordained to serve as priests. Nadab and Abihu, however, fell dead before the Lord when they made an offering with unauthorized fire before him in the desert of Sinai. They had no son, so only Eliezer and Ithamar served as priests during the lifetime of their father Aaron. All right? So, do you remember what happened to them, Nadab and Abihu, in Leviticus chapter 10? Well, you've got to know what happens in Leviticus 1 to 8 first, all right? So, the Lord has given the Israelites all the instructions about the sacrifices and what Aaron, as the high priest, has to do to make atonement for the sin of the people so that we can be at one man, there can be at one man between the people and the living God. And remember, like children dressing up in like superhero costumes, right? Aaron's uniform as high priest is like the Jesus costume, right? Now, Aaron sacrificing the animals, they're all a picture of how one day Jesus would come as the true and the great high priest who gives himself as the sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world and reconciles us to God. Without him, we are at enmity with God, and that's a dangerous place to be. You know, and all the other priests, those descended from him, they're supposed to help Aaron to do his job, the ministry of being a picture of Jesus. So, all, and all this is teaching the church then, teaching all of us now that we cannot approach or relate uh, or, or worship the Father all on our own. We need a mediator who brings us to the Father and who brings the reality of the Father to us. Jesus tells us, doesn't he? John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But anyway, on the very first day, after all these instructions were given, on the first day when Aaron played his role and acted out all this and offered all the sacrifices, in Leviticus 9, verses 23 to 24, what happened? The glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when the people saw it, they shouted for joy and they fell face down. That's the gospel in a nutshell, isn't it? It's saying that while it's not safe for any of us to be in God's presence because of our sin, where does the fire go towards? The fire doesn't go to the people who deserve it. The fire goes towards the sacrifice. Just as the fire, the, the, the wrath that we deserve falls on Jesus. And He, His mediation means that we can be friends. It can be safe for us to be in the presence of God. And do you see what it caused, what it brought to the people? It brought lots of joy, didn't it? But it also brought great reverence. They all fell face down. When was the last time any of us even knelt before the Father in prayer? Well, what did Nadab and Abihu think of all this? Not much, actually. Because after seeing all this, they still thought that, ah, do you know what, we don't need a mediator. We don't need Aaron, you know. Uh, they thought that there were other ways of approaching and worshipping God apart from Jesus. They thought that they had something to offer to God that He would please, be pleased with. They thought their sincerity, you know, what they felt was right and nice, was enough to quench the consuming fire of God's wrath against their sin. But did you, do you notice like what they felt, what they thought, did not matter a single bit. Because when they approached the living God all on their own, and they offered what they thought was their best and their most sincere efforts to Him, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 2, fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. So here in Numbers 3, the Lord is making sure that everyone is clear about the high priest and what he's meant to teach. You know, the way we structure church today might be different, but the message is exactly the same. You know, and so we need to make sure that right at the heart and center of the church, you know, we need to make sure that everyone knows that there is only, there's only ever been one mediator between God and humanity, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the man, Christ Jesus. Try to approach or relate or to worship God on your own apart from Jesus, all you will ever find is death, like with Nadab and Abihu. And the Lord wants us to be so clear about this that he repeats himself in chapter 3, verse 10. Do you see that? Appoint Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. Anyone else who approaches the sanctuary must be put to death. Or chapter 3, verse 38. Anyone who approached the sanctuary was to be put to death if you go in without a mediator. 
And do you know what? If anything, it's more serious now. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Sometimes people think, oh, the Old Testament, German, Sinai, thunder, everything, right? You know, uh, God was a bit cranky then, but He's mellowed down over the years. You know, it's New Testament times. We can all relax in His presence right now. That's not the logic of Hebrews 12 at all. The logic of Hebrews 12 is this. If it was so terrible on Mount Sinai, right? And that was just a picture of the true mountain of God. If it was so terrible for Nadab and Abihu, when they rejected just a picture of Jesus the high priest and all that he does for us, how much more terrible it is for us when we reject the Jesus, the real high priest. How much more reverence and awe we need to have now that we have seen the real thing. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, if they did not escape when they refused him, who, who warned them on earth at the tabernacle, at the picture stuff, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. So, and, and, and you know what? Read the, Old, read the New Testament, you know? Read the New Testament and you'll see that the Lord is still a consuming fire. He still strikes people in church dead who don't worship Him with reverence and awe. Right? Read through Acts, read 1 Corinthians, you'll see that. But we're just going to spend the last few minutes now looking at the Gershonites, the Kohathites, and the Merorites, all right? Um, there's a picture there uh, which basically explains the different responsibilities uh, that they have around the temple, uh, the tabernacle. So if the tabernacle is a stage on which the gospel is acted out, right? The, and if the priest and the animal sacrifices are the actors, then these guys, right, uh, Kohathites, Merorites, and uh, uh, Gershonites, they are what you might call the roadies. You know, those who did the heavy lifting, those who did the, the, the all sorts of stuff behind the scenes to make sure that the stage is uh, set up properly and treated properly and looked after, all right? And it's a reminder to all of us that yes, upfront leaders in the church are important, but declaring the gospel, showing off Jesus is not the job of just those at the front. We need lots of people joining in and we need equally, well actually I think we probably need even more humble and spirit-filled people for the behind the scenes and menial tasks uh, 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 as we do for those at the front, uh, uh, you know, those who do the front sort of jobs, okay? And so the gospel of Jesus is only properly proclaimed as every part of the body does its work, right? And, and we only ever grow if we do our work together as different parts of the same body. So I don't know, maybe think about this, discuss this. Uh, 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 what is, uh, what part of the body are you? What's the role that Jesus has given you to play? You know, what are some of the gifts? Where are some of the areas that you're not playing your part, that you're being called to serve in? I know many of you are. And you know, I was thinking about all this body, being part of Jesus' body stuff. Which part of Jesus' body would you rather be? I don't know. I thought about how it would be wonderful, isn't it? It's way better to be a toenail in Jesus' body, right? Even a rotten one, than to be a massive, clever brain outside of his body, right? Anyway, just one last point as we finish. The fact that these guys are all from the tribe of Levi reminds us that our past and our family background does not have to shape who and what we are. In Genesis chapter 49, verses 6 to 7, I'll just turn to it. Genesis 49, verses 6 to 7. Right, Levi seems to be a cursed tribe, right? Simeon, uh, 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 49 verses 5 to, to 7, all right? Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and humstrung oxen as they please. Cursed be their anger, so fierce and their fury, so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel, all right? So Levi was a very violent person, all right? And do you know what he did? Um, uh, 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 he used circumcision as a trick to uh, 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 defeat a whole, you know, to kill people. Basically, when people are circumcised, they were still in pain, he and his brother went out and slaughtered all of them. Good tactic, but evil. It's like someone, it's like if we invited people to come to church, right? Let's baptize you. Let's go and baptize you by the river, and then we drown them instead. That's what they were doing, all right? Using the gospel to, for the wrong reasons. But anyway, so the Lord said he's going to scatter them all over Israel. Yet in Exodus 32, his descendants gave themselves to the service of the Lord. 
And here they are now, being given the privilege of serving in the presence of the Lord. They are the ones, if you look, they are the ones who get to live nearest to where the Lord is. And yes, eventually when they entered the land, some of them were scattered, like the Lord said, but no more in a cursed sort of way. They were scattered, they were dispersed to go and teach people the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they themselves can be proclaimed, you know, we, are, we used to be a cursed people, but look, there's forgiveness. Our Lord is not holding our ancestors' sins against us. We can be free for that. We can now serve and teach everyone everywhere. And the Lord can do that for us. He can do that for everyone. You know, I was just thinking the other day, you know, sometimes it's easy, isn't it, to think about a really evil person who's become a Christian and say, if the Lord can save that person, He can save us. But the more and more I read in Scriptures and the more we know Jesus, what do we see? If the Lord can save someone like me, I have total confidence that He can save anyone like you because there is no one who is a worse sinner than myself, than ourselves. So I just want to encourage you, maybe you feel that you're being held back by your past, but you're never a victim of, your, of your, your character or your past or your family background. The Lord redeems everyone as we turn to Him and trust in Him. And no matter how much our ancestors messed up, no matter how much our parents messed us up, no matter how much we mess up, there is always new life, fruitful life, useful life for us. If we trust in Jesus, come to Him, come to church to be shaped and to be changed by Him. Amen.